Hey everyone, this is Rishi Rajani. I'm the CEO of Lena Waste Media Company, Helmingrad. And you're listening to Trust Me, I Know What I'm Doing. Yeah. My name is Abhay Dandekar, and I share conversations with talented and interesting individuals linked to the global Indian and South Asian community. It's informal and informative, adding insights to our evolving cultural expressions, where each person can proudly say, trust me, I know what I'm doing. Hi, everyone. On this episode of Trust Me, I Know What I'm Doing, a conversation with the producer and the CEO of Hillman grad, Rishi Rajani. Stay tuned. Once again, thank you for listening to Trust Me, I Know What I'm Doing and sharing it with your friends and for following along on social media. If you're enjoying it, please take a moment to submit a rating and review as it's super appreciated, especially because it feels great to share conversations that come from the heart and offer a platform here for community expression. So speaking of expression and platforms, on Trust Me, I Know What I'm Doing, one thing I try and elevate is storytelling. For some, it can maybe take years of practice, and for others, it may be combining natural instinct and practice to harness that gift of sharing stories that are so uniquely authentic and personal and reflective of one's inner voice and imagination. Now, in a sense, sharing a story offers a lot of self-fulfillment, no doubt. But listening to a story sometimes is even more possible because someone has lifted you onto a stage and amplified your voice and provided a backdrop that makes you and your story shine. And someone who's doing this on an ongoing basis for sure, particularly for communities of color and for the voices of those who are marginalized, is Rishi Rajani. Rishi is a South Asian American who grew up in upstate New York and in Oregon, and whose family came here via India, then Africa, and then the UK. He's been in the film and television industry for over a decade as a producer and a development executive. In 2018, Rishi joined Hillman Grad, the company founded by actor, producer, and Emmy-winning writer Lena Waith to advance the mission to create art that redefines the status quo by amplifying and celebrating the stories and voices of diverse, historically marginalized communities across all industries. Rishi became CEO in 2022, and he's had producing credits that have included The Shy, Gifted in Black, Boomerang, and The 40-Year-Old Version. He also originated Indeed's Rising Voices short film program, serves as an executive mentor for the Hillman Grad Mentorship Lab, and launched a South Asian mentorship program under The Salon. Now in 2023, he produced several film projects with even more coming, including Chang Ken Dunk that aired on Disney Plus, and also Being Mary Tyler Moore on HBO Max. Now I have to tell you, what's so compelling about Rishi is that even though it has come from a backdrop of superb effort and creative rigor, he makes inclusion feel natural and comforting and accessible. I had a chance to catch up with him to chat about everything from all the expectations to the evolution of his producing and relationship development to mentoring. And I started by asking him if he remembered when he first identified as being a South Asian American or even a person of color. Yeah, I, I do actually. And it's funny because my mom brings it up to me at, huh. at times. But um, when we had moved, my family had moved to upstate New York when I was three years old and lived in this little town called Watertown, New York. It was super close to the Canadian border. Yeah. And when I was in elementary school, the elementary school was mostly white. Um, the whole neighborhood, the whole area was mostly white. But I remember we had, gosh, it must have been third grade, fourth grade, something in there, mm -hmm. where we had this inter-elementary school field day. And okay. all these, you know, all of these um, various elementary schools from all around the region came and, and bust into, I think, a, you know, just like some of the fields, it was games, activities. Like a big great. fair. Yes. Yeah. And I remember there was one other brown kid. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, we ended up, you know, sizing each other up, right. talking to each other. Yeah. And it wasn't that he was brown that I got so excited about. It was that he was vegetarian. Huh. And yeah. I had had such an association with like, with like my identity, my cultural identity, being caught up in being vegetarian is the thing I probably talked about the most. It was like part of me <laughs> being at uh, school and being unable to eat school lunches. And I was so excited that there's this kid that was also brown, also vegetarian. Right. 
and I like went. My mom remembers like me going home, being like, "I met this other vegetarian kid," and like, like, it was okay, like it's really happened, finally. Right, it's so exciting. But I think listen, I think I've definitely had my own personal journey with with coming into my own in brownness. I like grew up in a lot of like extremely white environments, both yeah, say New York in a suburb of Portland, Oregon called Lake Oswego. Yeah, and I think I definitely you know ran away from that identity a lot growing up. Um, and it's only been in kind of like relatively recent in my life, like finding, you know, a lot of power in mm. who I am and power in the color of my skin. And yeah, and it's a lot of it's through storytelling, you know? And, yeah. Do you uh, ever find yourself running back to some of those instances or experiences too? Like because uh, of the, you know, the power that you see now, um, do you reflect back on some of those times where you were in a place of, you know, really profound whiteness, if you will, um, that you run back to those and, and you feel even more empowered for that matter. Yeah, it's it's actually, I really like the way you're putting that because it's, it's sort of like, you know, there are times where I get like annoyed or frustrated with myself for having been so indoctrinated into like wanting to be like typical or like yeah. average you know in in the context of like american also like what we see on screen right and what um you know we see on kind of a daily a daily basis and say to, to what being you know, who's allowed to be the hero yeah of something but i think you know it's a lot of actually you know my growth has been in, in leaving even the traditional studio system and coming to work at hillman grad and having in a boss um you know my boss is lena waith um an incredible um black queer uh, writer producer emmy award winner um yeah. and i think just seeing the way that she moves through the world and the kind of the fear fearlessness of it and the fierceness of it and um there i've learned a lot kind of in the context of the last five years and getting to work with artists from so many different backgrounds and so many more mm -hmm. just enfranchised populations and even the population I grew up in, in my cultural heritage, that, you know, there's a pride that develops. Yeah. Um, and it's taken me a while, I think, to get here, to get to this journey in this place. And I do reflect on kind of like where I came from and especially kind of those moments where you like define like who you are and your identity and your self-worth and especially in kind of those very instrumental moments in middle school and high school college that yeah. I'm like, oh man, like I wish that there was a, a you know, a, a 30, 30 year old version of myself that could go back and talk to the 12 year old version of myself. And right. Say, like, look, like it's, you know, there's things you don't quite get yet about this situation, but you know, you will. And it'll be right. Good. It's, it's certainly a wait for it moment because most of those middle schoolers and high schoolers perhaps are not uh, viewing themselves or their experiences as instrumental at the time. Right. <laughs> uh, but it's, it, it is great. I mean, yeah, I think you're, I think you're right. It's true that like, I mean, I grew up in a, in a very white neighborhood and um, thinking a little bit about how I felt then and the power I, I feel with my identity now, it's nice to actually reflect sometimes back on that and say, you know, there, there is a reason for, for the empowerment that was probably not realized then, but I'm grateful for those experiences and helping me realize it now. You you've been mm -hmm. in this, you know, business for for over a decade, and it's yeah. been a long time uh, for you to sort of realize and develop and and cultivate skills. H has it felt, you know, that with a cultural tide um, and a lot of momentum for inclusion and opportunity? that there's also been sort of a shift in expectations, especially as this develops even further. And, and also, you know, particularly I'm asking this for people who are leaders and people who are in positions of power. Um, I'm curious if the expectations now are changing pretty dramatically. Yeah, I think there, it's, it's twofold for me, right? There's on one hand, there is, you know, in any business, in any industry, I think we have grown up as South Asians, you know, with this very kind of competitive spirit and energy that you need to be the best. It's about being better than your brown peers versus, you know, being collaborative. And yeah. I work in a very collaborative industry. I work in, in film. You need a lot of people to come together to make a movie. Right. And it's, I think, a little bit of a, you know, shift in perspective 
that has been super necessary for people that are especially now brown leaders at the top of organizations. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, 10, 15 years ago, there was one seat at the table. It was one diversity spot. And you wouldn't, if you were the diverse person in that spot, you were speaking for every black, brown, queer, disabled per, you know, person as like the diverse voice of yeah. influence. And that's just not the case anymore. And it's partially not the case because we have more brown people that are in positions of power can hire other brown people for things. But it's, I think I'm seeing it too, and I'm seeing it in my like baby sister who's you know, a total Gen Z kid. Like that there's like a a shift in in perspective and, and mentality, even for people that are coming up and coming to their own now. Yeah. Like why are we doing why are we fitting into essentially what is like a white box that was given to us to be like to to integrate and to be accepted in this way, instead of actually you know, like taking it upon ourselves to find our communities and to support one another and to yeah. do that. And so I think that there's like that level of shift, which is like you're not the one brown person anymore. It's not, right. you, the goal is not to be the one brown person in the room anymore. Yeah. The goal is to, you know, create things and, and opportunities for, for everyone involved. But I think the other aspect that I would talk about is, is storytelling itself. Mm. You know, I'm in, I'm in an industry that's all about storytelling. And I think for the longest time, uh, you know, black and brown stories were incredibly monolithic. Yeah. And a lot of times they were about overcoming your otherness in a way. And I'm seeing a shift in both the types of stories that people want to tell and the filmmakers that you know I, I work with and engage with. Um, you know, I don't think everyone wants to make arranged marriage stories anymore. I God, I hope not. See yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think people want to see them either. You know, I or, think it's or, this... or they want to see they want to see stories, you know, let's even just take that for a second. If they did want to see yeah. arranged marriage stories, man, I hope they're wanting to see like all 25,000 versions of that, you know? Yes, um, exactly. And that's, and that's real. Right. And, and I think that there is this desire for content that represents cultural heritage as like part of an entire human experience sure. versus just the thing that's being focused on that heroes can come in, in every you know, different shape sizes. I, I wanted to, you know, touch on that for a second because you're right. There is so much, depth and diversity even to depth and diversity in storytelling yeah. right so like you know there's not one way to tell a a group uh story in that way you really have to identify all the portions of that group w would you consider yourself a um incubator or even an accelerator for that kind of activism you know i i've heard you share your thoughts on protest art if you will but in this particular yeah. medium is it important to be an incubator an accelerator a facilitator and and really have more of those kinds of roles in the industry totally i think you're also referencing what i think in so many ways i view the job of being a producer yes yeah. right it's like it's getting the opportunity to meet with artists storytellers who have an idea and then it's being able to take that idea work with them flush it out into a script, you know, sell that project to a studio or a network or financier, get the money, actually go make the project and then go and put it out to the world. Yeah. And I think like if at its core, the job of being a producer is to be the facilitator, you know, manager of a project from, from beginning to end, I think for me personally as a producer, um, I am super interested in stories that, were, I think, not very well represented while I was growing up, mm. um, being brought to the forefront and like being part of the person that is bringing those stories to the forefront. Yeah. And, um, you know, I just made this film, this incredibly talented filmmaker named Jingyi Shao. Um, it's a movie called Chang Can Dunk. Yeah. And it's essentially about a five foot seven Chinese American kid that makes a bet in front of his entire high school that he can dunk a basketball by homecoming. And, what was so exciting about it, and which is why I was almost like pinching myself while I was making the movie, is that it is a straight up coming of age movie with an Asian American protagonist. Mm. And not a side character, um, not kind of like somebody in the background, but it was his story, it was Chang's story. And the amount of impact that movie would have made on me growing up 
in terms of actually getting to see my own experience represented on screen, even if the person didn't look exactly like me, but more like me than anybody, than yeah, anybody else. True. It, it would have been a really big deal. Yeah. And I think I got such a rush out of making that movie and like even like, you know, such a rush out of like supporting all these different voices that I support. But I was like, this is what I want to do. I want to keep doing this again and again and again and again. Um, because I really like this thing that Virgil Abloh said, which is that you know everything I do is for my 17-year-old self. Yeah. And I'm like, well, I feel like everything I do is for like my 8 to 13-year-old <laughs> self in those most like formative years of growing up. And that's what I want to do. So those are the stories I want to incubate as much as I can. You're listening to Trust Me, I Know What I'm Doing. After a quick break, we'll come back to our conversation with Rishi Rajani. Stay tuned. Conversation. It's the antidote to apathy and the catalyst for relationships. I'm Abhay Dandekar, and I share conversations with global Indians and South Asians, so everyone can say, trust me, I know what I'm doing. New episodes weekly, wherever you listen to your podcasts. Hello, everyone. My name is Tam France, and you are listening to Trust Me, I Know What I'm Doing. Welcome back to Trust Me, I Know What I'm Doing. Let's rejoin our conversation now with producer and the CEO of Hillman Grad, Rishi Rajani. Well, and especially for those 8 to 13-year-olds and 17-year-olds that are out there that, that are going through that experience right now, that, that's yeah. going to be super powerful. Th- this concept of what you just mentioned, whether it's you know with Chan Kim Dunk or even some of the other projects that you're doing, you know this idea of, as you just kind of elegantly described, sort of the producer role, is that something that came naturally to you? Did you have to practice this quite a bit? And has the practice of it been iterative in that, hey, the, the more yeah. of these kinds of projects you do, the, the easier it gets to actually have that rush in telling that eight to 13 year old sort of version story? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, in terms of like the natural aspect of it, I mean, the, the thing that was natural was just a love of storytelling. Yeah. You know, I grew up in the library, I read a ton, watched a lot of movies, like adored storytelling as a medium. And because I read so much, I think it's it's helped me instinctually now mm. in terms of like being able to find what a good story is, like what great characters are, what right. propels something forward, um, what gets people engaged in watching still. The job of producing itself and actually the nuts and bolts of making a movie or show is absolutely iterative. Mm. It was a thing that I had to learn that I made a lot of mistakes along the way doing you know, from the very first series I produced, which was Boomerang season one for BET you sure. know, all the way to the last movie I produced being um, Shank and Dunk. Yeah. And along the way, I've gotten to work on various TV shows from 20s to the shy um, movies like the 40 year old version um, and a thousand and one. And I think for, yeah, it's like every time I'm on a production, I become a better producer. Yeah. But the thing that I will highlight is that it's actually really rare these days for you to get the opportunity as a younger producer to just get the reps in and yeah. go and make a bunch of content. It both yeah. takes really long to make movies and you don't get the opportunities and experience that much. I almost feel like I'm getting more of like a like a white guy during the 90s producer experience <laughs> where I've gotten to just be thrown into the deep end. Well, and be allowed to make mistakes. Yes, exactly, exactly, exactly. And that's something that I really hope for any aspiring producers, you know, from from underrepresented backgrounds that you also get the opportunity to fail and to to not get it done, not get the deal made, not do great on set. You know, you mentioned the um, idea also of like sort of being a bookworm and reading and also being a great listener in the capacity to be a better storyteller. How perhaps would you say that the experience of being an Indian American or South Asian American uh, integrated into that also to make you uh, love storytelling? It's an interesting question. I mean, I definitely grew up with both like a a love of, of American and Western storytelling and 
you know, Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings and, and all the Enid Blyton books, and yeah. you know, that were, were so kind of like consequential to my growing up. But I also grew up obsessed with the Ramayana and the Mahabharata and like getting told stories that were so in and of our culture that in a lot of ways were kind of my early experiences with dramatic and and serial storytelling too. Yeah. You know, I got like that big stack of like the comic book version <laughs> of like the, the Ramayana. You, you know, I have to tell you, I, I actually had the editor of that Amar Chitrakatha comic book series on. And oh, wow. Oh my God. I can't tell you how like instrumental like all those were for so many different people. Um, yeah. Wait, that's so cool. Yeah, I mean, I, I can picture them in my head, you know? And my parents are also really big on those um those great illustrated classics books. Yeah, yep. Uh, which were like the kind of like the, the kid version of like <laughs> yeah. classic. Yeah. I loved those. And like, I fell in love with like, like 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea and Journey right. to the Center of the Earth. Yeah. Uh, and the Sherlock Holmes books. And this like classic venture storytelling yeah what's so wild about those books though is that they were always white guys at, yeah. <laughs> at, the, at the at the center of them uh except for Twenty Thousand leagues which like even though he's been whitewashed and played by white people throughout like all of cinematic history captain nemo is brown i know and like yeah. i don't know how people don't know that <laughs> well there you go right and, and perhaps uh you know his Perhaps one day he'll be uh, portrayed as a vegetarian as well. We'll see. Oh, there you go. <laughs> um, no, but I mean, you know, like in, in that way, sort of the idea of growing up brown in very white neighborhoods, but at the same time kind of taking that legacy forward sounds like that's impacted you. And I mean, you know, for you, does it also give you, now that you're enjoying the iterations, does it give you the licensure to sort of weave some of that into your future work? I think so you know and i think it's also just being really conscious of like i devoured so many different kinds of material from so many different cultural backgrounds so many different artists so many different authors that to me i love this idea of allowing people a platform to tell a story that is like utterly unique to who they are yeah and that doesn't just mean being a brown person and telling a brown story right it's, you know it, it, it's telling the story that is uniquely you but I think like what I hope to do is be putting more brown stories on the screen that can be as like traditional as doing an adaptation of an epic, you know, Hindu story, or that is just a piece about being a person who's falling in love right. or being the knight who's riding on horseback and slaying a dragon, you know, yeah. like those things are fair, also fair game for brown people. Yeah. And they're authentic, whether they're being told from a brown lens or not. You know, the the work that you describe, right? Chang Kim Dunk, being Mary Tyler Moore, gifted and black and, and the Shy's sixth season. These are all 2023 projects among many, many others yeah. that are out there for you. But is there a common thread that connects the dots with all of these? Is it the kind yeah. of, you know, authentic storytelling that you're talking about? You know, and by the way, is... Is connecting the dots with all these even necessary? They don't have to be connected. Yeah. No, I, I mean it's a good question because I do think there there is a connection point to between all of them. It's and it's all of them are are really authentic stories of people who haven't always had a voice, right? Yeah. And I think it's like from the kids in the shy to Chang to uh, Tiana Taylor's uh, incredible depiction of Inez in A.V. Rockwell's A Thousand and One. To Mary Tyler Moore, who happens yeah. to be a white woman, but was a groundbreaking white woman who existed in a space where she did not have a voice. Yeah. And the movie is an exploration of who she really was authentically as a human being and an individual, you know, outside of this image that was crafted and cultivated for her. Right. You know, Gifted in Black is, is a project that I'm so excited about because James Adolphus took this really brilliant, um, you know, imagining of what Swiss Beats and Timbaland did during the pandemic with their versus music battles yeah, and reflected on the question of, you know, why does America in times of struggle turn to black music for comfort? Right. Yep. And I love that as just a thesis and a jumping off point, but again, so representative of the various dichotomies of our culture and who we are and yeah. what we rely on or rely on. So 
it, it's that's a it's a not only just an interesting thesis, but one that sort of for me personally hits home because a the theme music of this podcast is definitely based on a lot of soul and retro, uh, you know, <laughs> I think black traditional black music, but yet the the concept of how you then weave that into your own personal story. I mean, I could certainly see that thesis also intersecting with a recall of each person's own cultural heritage at the same time. There's no reason why you can't have the soul of a Stevie Wonder or Marvin Gaye hit you the same way that a Bossidy flute classical Indian piece would um, because it reminds you of a, of a childhood experience that you had in your parents' house or something like that. Absolutely. In catering these or bringing these stories forward in kind of being the, the steward uh, of that storytelling, as, as you mentioned, and also kind of like the voices that aren't um, heard traditionally. You, you're also very passionate, I know, about mentorship and really sort of like taking that piece forward. And, and in, in, in this industry where paying things forward is in many ways so vital to longevity, I'm curious what you've learned about yourself in, yeah. in particularly taking on more mentorship responsibilities. Totally. I think, um, you know, our reflection of mentorship, the reason why we do, why mentorship is so key to us is because I think we're being told constantly that there weren't the, weren't the filmmakers that existed that happened to be, you know, from an underrepresented background to make these projects. Or there are people that didn't have enough experience or, you know, didn't, weren't, weren't given kind of access to the right rooms and opportunities. Mm -hmm. And so when we were constantly told that the pool didn't exist, when we had to go and find and make the pool ourselves, And it's the truth is it's not that difficult to give someone an opportunity. Right. And which is why I think like across all the projects that we were just talking about, like we do have people of color behind the camera on every single one. Right. And I think looking forward, you know, I have certainly learned I think in being a mentor, I've learned how much I lacked uh, um, really representative mentorship. Hmm. Yeah. Um, coming up, like I never really had anyone who looked like me that was mentoring me. Sure. I got a lot of great mentorship from a lot of great people. Yeah. Um, and people that really believed in me from you know Dana Spector, who was my first boss out here, who was the agent that I worked for. You know, to, to Catherine Pope, who was a woman that, you know, really kind of helped me explore the television space when I was at Studio 8. You know, had a lot of great people. To Lena now, you know. Mm. But there's something, there's a, a shorthand and kind of like a cultural shorthand in mentorship is utterly invaluable. Mm. Um, and I've had the opportunity of being part of this program called The Salon that was started by Bash Naren and Ray right. Chipper and Nick Dodani. And they brought me in to help on the mentorship side. And I've had two incredible mentees over the course of the past couple of years. And it's been so fun to get yeah. to like have a shared and joint experience while also, um, you know, helping them find their footholds in this business, in this industry. And so they're definitely like, I, I've learned that, that I, um, that I almost need the mentorship connection now as much as I did back then because it's a community connection. You know, now in, in that same vein, because like you identify that there was a gap back then for you, and yet, you know, the institutional memory of brown people, South Asians in Hollywood is, you know, certainly short because of, you know, the digital era of a lot of disposable content, so to speak. And yet now thinking about like how much you enjoy it and, you know, also because of the yeah. void that it fills, is that a relative surprise, you know, for you? I don't know if it's not just, as much of a surprise because I love people yeah. <laughs> and I love that con those connection points. Yeah. I think what was maybe a little bit more of a surprise and sort of just general reminder to me that it's not just mentoring for the sake of mentoring because it's some philanthropic or charitable thing. Yeah. I'm helping craft a community that I want to be part of. Yeah. Like I'm working with filmmakers that whose movies I want to produce. Like there's actually like a very good yeah. business proposition <laughs> That's right. in, in mentorship and being a producer and then yeah. being like, oh wait, I, I hope to work with these executives one day. I hope to yeah. work with these writers one day, these producers, these actors. That's, That's a pipe, so pipeline exciting. development. Yeah. Yeah. 
Absolutely. And and all it is 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 giving, you know, access and education and understanding to individuals. But on the other side of it, I'm like, hell yeah, this yeah. is awesome. Like we're we're building the community that that is going to help propel our industry further in the future. And that's across both the salon program and the mentorship programs that we're doing here at Hillman Grad and the Rising Voices program, which is a filmmaker workshop that we do with Indeed, who was cool enough yeah. to be like, hey, you know, we want to help people find jobs. And that includes in the film and TV space. And if you're from a diverse background and you don't have the opportunity or money to make a hundred thousand dollar short film, here you go. Come make yeah. it with us. Come get real mentorship. Come get real producers on board to help you out. And so it's that type of real kind of forward taking initiatives, forward thinking initiatives that are, I think, really key to us. You're listening to Trust Me, I Know What I'm Doing. After a quick break, let's come back to our conversation with Rishi Rajani. Stay tuned. Every story told is a lesson learned, and every lesson learned is a story waiting to be told. I'm Abhay Dandekar, and I share conversations with global Indians and South Asians so everyone can say, trust me, I know what I'm doing. New episodes weekly, wherever you listen to your podcasts. Hi guys, I'm Karan Barar. I'm an actor, director, and producer here in LA. And you're listening to Trust Me, I Know What I'm Doing. Hi there, I'm Abhay Dandekar, and you're listening to Trust Me, I Know What I'm Doing. Let's rejoin our conversation now with producer and the CEO of Hillman Grad, Rishi Rajani. First off, I mean... You know, kudos. I'm, I'm sure you guys have heard this before, but the entire idea of Hillman Grad being sort of loosely based on the HBCU of Denise Huxtable, you know, and and sort of, you know, and, so it's all Lena. It's all, all Lena. Lena. There Lena's, you go. Lena, Lena's dream <laughs> you, you brought know, to life. Yeah, and and this this concept of, of course, being committed to offering people of color and artists from marginalized communities or or communities you know, that lack of voice or lack of visibility um, to, to now be in sort of the spotlight and create those opportunities that you mentioned with particularly the eye on equity, for sure. Uh, bear with me in winding through this for a second. I, I couldn't help but thinking of um, the kind of idea, though, that there's still so much work to do in this kind of Hollywood universe. And it brought me to sort of think about Deion Sanders, and what I'm thinking about is, you know, Deion Sanders, great football player, great, great career, but developed a, an amazing success as a football coach at Jackson State, which is not a fictional, but a real um, HBCU. And with that success, of course, certainly had his eyes on a larger prize, right? So like stepped from there to go to coach in Colorado in the Pac-12 and in many ways now is, is sort of embedded deeply into a much, much bigger institution. And, you know, le kind of leaving the HBCU piece behind, you know, it's sort of, it, it can't help but think of it more as sort of a stepping stone or even just sort of like a, a smaller piece on the way to being part of the, the larger sort of puzzle. Is there some risk of that when you're cultivating this, when you're thinking about mentorship, when you're actually part of a company that provides that first, that second opportunity, and yet is is the artist I always still on saying, hey, well, my next stop is the larger institution and the institution that right. perhaps didn't provide that first or that second opportunity. I, by the way, I hope that makes sense. Totally makes sense. By the way, I think that's like the like one of the biggest fears for a producer, right? Is that you know you you put so much work and effort and energy into making someone's first film, and then they immediately get snatched up by Marvel, and you won't get to work with them for the next ten to fifteen years, right. you know? Right. Um, and I think like it's valid, and that's going to happen. You yeah. Know? Like there, there's there's no world in which that won't happen on our ends. But I think what we try and talk about, and this is what I tell my executive team as well, is that Hollywood is such a relationship based game. You know, and a relationship with an artist or filmmaker is a very intimate one. And you go through a lot of shit together when you're on set and yeah. develop a movie. And it's there's a level of emotional vulnerability to it that comes into question when you're trying to tell a story that really means a lot to you. 
um, you know, I, I, I love that, like, with Jing on the set of um, Chang and Dunk is that sometimes we would be on set and he'd be really frustrated or like we lost a location or something was happening. And Jing grew up a basketball player and yeah. he would really like to shoot threes um, during our lunch break sometimes. <laughs> and I would just be hanging out with him and rebounding the ball. Yeah. You know? And to me, that was the best producer that I could be in that moment. It's right. like to be there and to, to, to have like an emotional engagement and understanding. Yeah. And I kind of love that about producing. I think that's a genuine connection, right? And yeah. you're never going to guarantee that someone's going to work with you on their next project. But if you build the real genuine connection point with them, the goal and the hope is that when you're, you guys come together to do a second movie and you're working on that second movie together. And because you're a producer, mm. you can go and produce a movie that's a studio film after doing an independent film. Sure. You can go off and pitch a project to Marvel or DC together. Yeah. And you're not always going to get to be part of everything, but if you really work your hardest and do your best job being a producer, then the goal is to have repeat business. People wanting to work with you again and again. And again. Yeah, and I'm, I'm imagining that like anything else, you know, um, relationship development is just truly king. And, yeah. and that kind of uh, magic, of course, whether it means that someone gets snatched up or not, that part hopefully is, is one that's kind of everlasting and evergreen. Um, yeah. I sort of wanted to leap on this one, and that is what elements now, given this entire sort of backdrop, what, what elements now of storytelling um, or facilitating that storytelling particularly are, are ones that await you because they are currently gaps in the storytelling universe. And I mean, and not only are they gaps, but they're high priority gaps, you know, stories that need to be told almost now. Yeah. I think there are a lot. Yeah. <laughs> there are a lot of I mean, stories right. There's, there's a large, you know, sort of bathtub there. But my inclination of if we're going to break it down to just like buckets, right, in, yeah. in arenas of storytelling, I think a lot of times stories of people of color or stories of other under, underrepresented backgrounds, whether it's sexuality or, or disability, financial status, a lot of times those stories get relegated to the independent film space or to the very small TV, voice-driven, low-budget space. Yeah. And I think that has been, you know, understood as a lot of these groups have been gaining a foothold within the business and the industry. But what I really hope to see and what I think needs to be seen now is taking those stories and looking at bigger canvases for them. More genre storytelling, more sci-fi, more fantasy that happens to be through a POC or queer lens, you know? Yeah. Or, or even looking at sort of like big romantic comedies or what, you know, we haven't had a South Asian version of a Crazy Rich Asians yet, you know? Yeah, yeah. And so there's, I want us to be moving into kind of this 2.0, I guess, like period of time of the diversity movement. Yeah. Which feels sometimes like a little bit in question as these kind of big disruptions are happening in the business and yeah. streamers are condensing and people are losing their diversity initiatives that people might be losing you know, this idea that there are audiences for these stories. There are people that really want to go to the movie theaters or buy a film online to watch or watch it through their streamer that desire this level of content. And I think that that is both for the, you know, the Asian American experience, but also kind of like the global experience overall. So I'm really hoping to see more of that. And I'm hoping to make more of that. Like I grew up on Star Wars and Indiana Jones and gigantic movies. And I want to yeah. make those movies that happen in the future. So I want to look like us. So. Um, and, and just to sort of capitalize on that, uh, one last thought was, you know, you were just sharing about your family's journey, connecting the dots from India to uh, Africa and then, you know, the UK and then to here. And then, of course, you mentioned that the sort of global audience and the appetite for that globally and knowing that of course the south asian diaspora is just so incredibly diverse i mean this certainly resonates as great storytelling for say the indian or the south asian american do, do you think that the appetite is growing and evolving and also certainly for that matter appropriately different for those south asians who are you know in india who are in pakistan who are in the uk who are in Fiji or in Africa as well. How, how do you hope to sort of, again, tackle that sort of broad diversity as well? Absolutely. 
And I've been so excited to hear it. I haven't been back to India since I think I was 16. But for all my friends that have been back there, they talk about this burgeoning art, independent film scene that's happening with kind of the next generation of kids, artists, like wanting to step in this space. I think I'm definitely seeing it in the UK, in which, you know, South Asians are an even bigger presence, like within the demographic of the country than they yeah. are in the US. But I think that one of the things that we always tell our writers that we work with is that within, you know, specificity, there is universality. Yeah. And so I think we should be telling stories that are ultra specific mm. to those individuals and the reason. But sometimes those stories actually help us realize how much more similar that we are to one another, even if it's just talking about the South Asian community as a whole, because we're a massive diaspora, you know, right. with so many different languages and cultures and traditions and regions and areas we move in, and, you know, and, and I think for us, there just isn't enough storytelling. Yeah. And so the more storytelling there is, the more people are able to find themselves and see themselves in the work. Well, for everyone finding themselves through both specificity and universality, Rishi, we're, we're grateful that you're providing a space for it. Um, thank you so, so much for, for joining us for, for this conversation. And I hope we can visit with you again down the road. Yeah, this was really lovely. Thank you so much again. Thanks so much again, Rishi. And thank you all again for listening and sharing and rating and spreading the word about Trust Me, I Know What I'm Doing. Till next time, I'm Abhay Dharndegar. <laughs>